Christmas is both cosmic and terrestrial. Angels from Empyrean regions sing to outcasts, and a divine baby is born where animals feed. In a Christmas poem, G.K. Chesterton captured this great paradox, proclaiming, glory to God in the lowest. But there is another oft-forgotten paradox in the mystery of Christmas. In Christ, the moral chaos of human history is conquered by and fully drawn into the perfect symmetry of salvation. In his descent, our spiritual wreckage is reshaped and made beautiful. As the prophet Isaiah declares, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. We see a celebration of this profound reality in one of the most mathematically ingenious masterpieces ever conceived by the human mind. The North Rose Window at Chart Cathedral. To understand the interplay of human sinfulness and divine redemption in that great work of art, symbolizing human nature healed by grace, we must turn our attention to what seems to many the most boring passage in the New Testament, the genealogy beginning the Gospel of St. Matthew. It is read at the threshold of Christmas on December 17, the beginning of the O Antiphons, O Sapientia, O Wisdom. Yet this too is paradoxical, for the genealogy of Jesus is thoroughly saturated with foolishness and destructiveness, with lust, greed, envy, and murder. Matthew lists 14 generations between Abraham and King David, 14 generations between King David and the exile, and then 14 generations until Jesus, the definitive king. With the artist of the majestic window of Chart, we narrow our focus and attend to some of the reigning kings of Judah, beginning with David. This great king famously committed adultery with Bathsheba, conceived a love child with her, and then covered up his misdeed by having her husband killed. The child died, but later they would have Solomon, heir of the promise. Like his father, Solomon coveted beautiful women, but also wealth, power, and international acclaim. He set the stage for political tragedy in the next generation. Solomon's son, Rehoboam, badly misruled his grandfather's kingdom and would lose most of it through a revolt against his cruel and oppressive tactics. Rehoboam's son, Abijah, was just as terrible as his father. A later king, Jehoram, had a murderous devotion to political power on par with King Herod, the man who had all the young boys in and around Bethlehem slaughtered at the news of Jesus' birth. Jehoram loved power so much that he killed his six brothers, plus some Israelite princes, to secure the throne. Jehoram's son, Ahaziah, was a devotee of pagan gods. His descendant, Ahaz, also embraced paganism. Setting up a pagan altar in the temple, he sacrificed his son to Moloch, the Canaanite deity. The grandson of Ahaz, Manasseh, reigned for 50 years and followed suit, burning babies alive to Moloch. Manasseh's son Amon was as appalling as his father. Amon's descendant Jeconiah only reigned for three months and ten days before the Babylonians swept in and destroyed Jerusalem and took him and the people off to Babylon. God, it seemed, 
had had quite enough from the line of David. All of this lies behind what St. Matthew calls the book of the generations of Jesus Christ. The point is clear. Jesus came from a family that included murderers, cowards, adulterers, and liars. In a word, sinners. Which brings us back to the North Rose window of Chart. The rose represents divine perfection with a series of circles surrounding a central circle. There at the center of the beautifully colored tiles, still clear after 800 years, reigns the Blessed Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus on her lap. Above her are descending doves, an image of the Holy Spirit, and below her are adoring angels. Surrounding them are 12 of the kings in the narrative of Davidic royalty. Not only David himself, but also kings like Solomon, Abijah, Ahaz, Manasseh, Jehoram, and Rehoboam. Each of Judah's kings is robed in regal splendor without a single indication of their depravity. Rather, the sinful chaos of their lives is drawn into an overlapping divine geometry and symmetry. The window has repetitive sequences of 12, the product of three persons of the Trinity multiplied by the four elements, water, earth, fire, and air. The doves and angels that surround the virgin and child amount to 12 circles. Then, moving outward, come the 12 Davidic kings. Their figures are not circles, but squares, whose four points represent the elements and contrast with the circles, an exemplification of our fallen human nature. Next comes a ring of 12 fleur-de-lis patterns, the symbol of the Annunciation. The fleur-de-lis are contained within clover-like figures that have four lobes that are almost circular, symbolizing nature being reshaped by grace. In the outer ring, in 12 semicircles, we find 12 prophets, some of whom announced God's word to the often heedless ears of the kings. But this is only what the eye can easily discern. The deepest level of the rose's geometry is found in the golden spiral, which is based on a series of ascending numbers. Each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers. Zero, one, one, two, three, five, and so on. This pattern, introduced to Europe in 1202 by Leonardo of Pisa, can be found in nature itself, in roses, pine cones, daisies, even in the structure of atomic nuclei, the most cutting-edge mathematics of the day. The golden spiral is the governing geometry of the North Rose. Draw a spiral from the center of any of the prophets, and it will pass from the prophets through the kings and arrive at the Virgin. There are 12 such spirals, representing the Word of God through whom all things were made, passing through history to become flesh in the womb of the Virgin. All of this involves a much larger geometric figure than the window reveals. The prophets are in semicircles, not full circles, as they connect the visible rose to its invisible parameters. The message, God is beyond history. Yet all the while, intimately present to it, He shapes history not through coercive action, but through His presence, through His Word, through a deep structure that sweeps into itself all of our hard edges. The North Rose proclaims in geometry what St. Matthew proclaimed in words, that one cannot sink so low as to be beyond God's reach. For if these thieves child killers and greedy potentates can be God's family, 
the very path that God followed into the world, what keeps us from becoming his adopted children? We conclude at the center with Jesus and his blessed mother. The Holy Spirit hovers over Mary, just as the Spirit of God swept over the waters at the advent of creation. Mary assented to the new and surprising, to God's future, not her own. And something new, something impossible to anticipate, happened. God created the world from nothing, but the void of the chosen people's sinful past ushered in a new world. It is a world beyond sin and death, of eternal love and everlasting life. The window is a sign of the mysterious interplay of human sin and divine salvation. God opens a space for the abuse of our freedom, but then powerfully defeats it, integrating it into an astonishingly complex and beautiful design. That is the mystery of the Incarnation portrayed in the geometry of the North Rose window. Outrushing the fall of man, Chesterton added, is the height of the fall of God. And that is perfect hope. Hope for each and every person who calls on the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world. Jesus, son of Jehoram, son of Manasseh, but above all, son of the Father and son of Mary and Joseph, the masterpieces of the Father's art. May the light of his nativity shine upon us.